There's no denying that we live in a very digital age, and today I want to talk to you about how my high schoolers are using technology in our homeschool. Hey guys, and welcome back to my Practically Imperfect Life. My name's Abby, and I'm a homeschooling mom of two high school students. Today's video is part of a monthly show and tell series hosted by Abby from Rooted in Rest and Jessica from the Waldock Way. And you can find the playlist with videos from homeschooling moms all over the country with kids of all different ages down below in the description box if you would like to check that out. So today we're gonna to talk about technology and how we utilize it in our homeschool. And you know, let's be honest, we do live in a very digital, online heavy age. So how do we work that into our homeschooling routine without it kind of distracting or taking away from the learning? So when I was thinking about how I wanted to approach this subject, I thought, well, let's talk about hardware first, like the actual things we use, and then how we utilize different programs, and then just talk a little bit about my philosophy on screen times and, um, you know, as far as monitoring, you know, what the kids are and are not doing. So hardware will be the first thing we will talk about today. So we are very much an Apple family. We, we really prefer Apple products. We all have iPhones, all of our computers are Apple computers. And we very much like those because they kind of talk to one another. You know, things flow back and forth from one to the other very easily. It's easy for us to know how to work all of the different features on things. So we started off with a Mac desktop. Um, that's like my primary computer. But the first year of middle school, we knew we needed a laptop. Uh, the kids had some online programs. They were starting to do more typing assignments. So we, we needed to have something they could work on while I was working on mine as well, or so we could have a student at each one. So we picked up a MacBook Air and we don't have, you know, fancy ones with tons of internal memory or tons of processing power. It's enough to do what we need to do for school. And that's the whole purpose of buying it. So we got the model up here and I will go ahead and I will link the most current model down below for you if you'd like to check that out. It is an investment. I'm not going to lie, but they work beautifully. They hold up really well and we've had absolutely no issues with it. In fact, this past summer we made the decision to purchase a second laptop. So now we have the desktop plus two laptops and that might seem like a lot, but essentially I wanted to have one that each student could use at the same time. Um, and when I talk a bit about how we utilize that, I'll explain why having more than one was becoming necessary. So we do use that. We are also big fans of AirPods, and it might sound funny to include that in how we use it for our homeschool, but it, it does play an important role in a couple of ways. Um, first of all, we needed some sort of headphones because they are watching videos or tutorials for their courses. And we didn't want one sitting next to the other with one being distracted by what the other was listening to. And I like AirPods again, because they work really well and they automatically connect to the laptop. So it doesn't matter which laptop they're working on, the AirPods will connect to it. They can also connect them to their phones. And my kids kind of take after me in that when it's too quiet, it's hard to focus, um, which sounds funny, but some people just work better that way. Some like absolute quiet and some need to have some background noise going on. I know whenever I'm doing you know, anything, whether it's cleaning or cooking or whatnot, I usually have like a podcast or a YouTube video or an old show, something playing in the background that I can listen to. And my kids are the same way, except they love to have music going pretty much nonstop. And as long as it's not distracting from the learning and actually helping them focus, I'm okay with them playing music and listening to it you know, throughout the day. So again, it's so they can have that and they can use that for their um, for their focusing needs without it being distracting to the other people in the room. As our computer usage went up for school, we also purchased some blue light glasses. So we actually found just these basic ones on Amazon and they've been helpful for my teens because it, you know, it does limit the damage or the ache that their eyes get from looking at screens during the school day. And so they just pop those on and wear them. Um, both of my kids wear contacts or glasses, but they prefer their contacts. So the blue light glasses work perfectly with that. And if your teen is doing increased work on screen time, you know, I would definitely recommend you check them out. They were very inexpensive, but have been quite helpful. Another piece of technology that we introduced to our homeschool this year is our Texas Instrument TI-84 calculator. Now we particularly chose this one because it has a color screen. 
if you remember when we used those back in high school, we had like the old school ones. They were big, bulky, heavy. The screens were really hard to see, but I wanted one that would be easy for both of the kids to use for their math courses. We really could have used this last year when my daughter was in geometry and there was so much graphing and things like that that she needed to do. And so I thought, well, for sure for algebra two, we wanted to have it. And my son was starting to take an algebra slash geometry course this year. So it just seemed like a good investment. Uh, this one is rechargeable. So it just plugs right into a USB port, um, put that into the wall and it charges up. It holds its charge for a very long time. And again, the screen is color. So it's nice and bright when they do graphing, it's easy to see um, and able to put in you know, the information and, and just be able to run through the functions. I will highly recommend that you keep the user manual for these. Uh, there are a lot of functions on a graphing calculator and it's you know, impossible to really memorize them all unless you're using it all the time. And so we keep that around. So if there's something that comes up in their math course and they're not quite sure how to do that function on the, on the graphing calculator, and I don't know how to do it on the graphing calculator, we can just look in that, in that user manual and be able to figure it out that way. But it has been really helpful for both of them in their math courses this year. So moving on from hardware, as far as actual online courses. We don't do too many that are exclusively online. My son does take math through Shoreman Math. And for that course, the lecture videos, the assignments, the tests, the quizzes, everything is 100% online, you know, except for when he's working out problems on scratch paper. It's even graded. It's fantastic. For history, my daughter does a distance learning course from BJU. And so the lectures, tests, and quizzes are online for that. But then she does have a physical textbook and a physical workbook. Other than that, we really don't use a lot of online courses. Now, we do have to watch quite a few documentaries and YouTube videos for their guest hollow courses. That's kind of a part of the, um, the coursework for those. But it's usually limited to anywhere from 15 minutes to a half hour most days as far as what they need to be online for for those courses, you know, unless it's a longer documentary. But that's the rare occasion. So we really aren't focusing solely online. Uh, very much during the day. However, we do use a lot of programs on our computers pretty consistently. One of them is Microsoft Office. Now, if you remember kind of back in the day, you used to buy like the disks for Microsoft Office, you'd install it on the computer and then you'd have to wait till the next update came. Anyways, now uh, Microsoft Office is a um, like a subscription. It's Microsoft 365. So when you pay for the subscription, you get it access to all of those programs. I believe it's on five devices and we have it on the two laptops, the desktop, and then I actually have it on my phone. Uh, so we could have another device if we needed to. And you get the basic products. You get Excel, you get PowerPoint, you get Microsoft Word, you get Outlook, and I think OneNote, which we don't really use. But we use Word and Excel and the PowerPoint extensively. So all of the assignments that my kids have to type up for their writing or for their English courses or you know, anything else that requires a writing assignment, I have them type on Microsoft Word. So they've learned to be pretty proficient in how to format papers in Word. We also use Excel a lot, uh, not only for my own purposes, like I have my lesson plan set up on an Excel document, our grade books that we use that I have shown in previous grading videos, are on Excel. Uh, it's nice because again, you can put formulas in the cells on Excel and be able to easily, you know, kind of make things populate. But Excel is also a really great tool if you are doing science courses that are going to require you to track data or graph results or look at trends because in Excel you can put that in and then you can create graphs. And then PowerPoint, we use that for them to put together presentations. So a few times a year, they will have to give uh, you know, some sort of a slideshow presentation along with a speech. And so I want them to be able to put together those slideshows appropriately in PowerPoint. So we do use those things quite a lot. Now, another feature of the Microsoft 365 that I forgot to mention was OneDrive. And OneDrive is actually, I can't believe I forgot it because it's actually my favorite part of the subscription. So OneDrive is essentially like a virtual folder or, or one that's up in the cloud where you can save everything. We used to use like Carbonite and things like that back in the day, but since this is included in Microsoft 365, I thought, well, let's go ahead and, and use it. So we utilize that a ton. I have folders within our, our OneDrive storage drive 
for everything. I keep things on there for business related stuff, home remodeling stuff, pictures from everywhere. So it's somewhere safe. I have homeschooling folders in there where I save all of my information and we have folders in there where the kids submit their assignments. Again, it shows up on every user profile on every device. So if my daughter's working on a paper on one of the laptops, she can save it to OneDrive. And then as soon as she saves it to there, I can see the updated version on a different device in OneDrive. So they talk to each other. Um, it's saved in multiple places. You know, if something happens on your laptop, it's auto saving. So if your computer crashes, it auto saves at that last point to the OneDrive. It's just been really, really nice um, and it allows us to, you know, be able to grade things and look at things on different devices without necessarily always having to print it out or worried about it being lost or not saving appropriately. So really nice feature um, with that and something that we highly, highly utilize. So as far as what we do online for high school, we do utilize quite a few YouTube videos uh, throughout the school year. Some of them are already kind of pre-selected. They're part of curriculum that we use, but I've also found that there's some really great resources available on YouTube. If you've not checked out uh, Crash Course, highly recommend it. There's everything from literature guides to information on uh, college prep to how to study, how to take notes. There's courses in there on world history, US history, the constitution, um, biology, chemistry, anatomy. There's so many great videos. They are entertaining and full of information. So I really recommend that site. Um, there's another one called Sci, I think it's called like SciShow, all kinds of science experiments and looking into different science topics. I mean, you can really go to town. There's, I know there's a lot of garbage on YouTube too, but there's also a lot of really great information and resources. There's also really good tutorials on how to utilize Microsoft Office. And that is another thing that I have bookmarked. Uh, short videos that show you different features of Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, and then how to you know, go through and utilize that and take advantage of all of the great features of those programs. So if your student is just starting out using those programs and maybe you aren't as familiar with it, I would go on and I would create you know, a little folder, a playlist of things that will help them, little tutorials that they can do. You could maybe work this into kind of like a um, computer basics typing um, program, you know, something that they do as a, as a grade or as, as a course or elective, being able to learn how to utilize those, those products and doing, you know, all of the different things that they can do with it. As far as what we search for online, um, we don't use the internet a ton for research purposes. My preference is that they utilize our homeschool library, which is pretty extensive, or books from the library when we're doing research projects. However, yes, you can find some good information online. Um, my one rule is that it better never come from Wikipedia because anybody can ent um, enter in and edit that information. So we have learned, um, or we have been teaching them how to find good resources online. So how do you tell if a site is credible? How do you look for publication dates and authors? You know, who is actually putting the information out there? How to find research papers and be able to credit those that you find online? And that is an important skill for them to learn because once they hit college, they are going to have to do research papers for their courses. I mean, most courses are going to require some kind of a research paper at some point. And so you need to know how to find quality sources and then how to cite them if you are finding them online. So we thought better start practicing that while we're here at home. All right, so let's talk a little bit about screen time and parental controls when it comes to device usage or internet usage. I mentioned that we're big fans of Apple products and part of the reason I like that is because of screen time controls. Now, each of my kids does have their own Apple ID. When they initially got their first cell phone, we did set them up each with an Apple ID. One of the reasons I like that is because from my phone, because mine's the parent account, I can set screen time limitations on their devices or anything where they're logged in under their user ID. So from my phone, I can go in and I can set downtime restrictions. So times when devices and apps are shut down. Typically for us, that's going to be from, you know, mid evening until the end of the school day the next day. 
And so with the exception of certain apps or applications that I allow them access to all the time, everything else is blocked out. I can also put time limitations on things. How much time am I okay with you spending on YouTube, Firefox, um, you know, messages and, you know, different apps. I can either choose to put time restrictions on apps individually, or I can do them as a whole. So if I wanted to look at games, I could put a time limit on any app that falls under the game category. And no matter, you know, which game they're on, when they hit that limit, it blocks it. The app closes. And the only way they can continue using it is by sending a request to me. And then I have to determine if I'm going to approve that or not. I can also set content restrictions. So music that they listen to has to be a clean version. Shows have to be a certain rating. Movies have to be a certain rating. Um, you know, it helps me block websites that I don't want them to be on. There's just a lot that I can do within screen time controls to help keep the kids focused on what they need to be focused on at different times and keep them out of things that I don't want them to be on. So I wanted to end with just a few thoughts on screen time and device usage. Um, first of all, I'm not going to tell you exactly how much screen time my kids get or what apps or shows or programs I do and do not allow them to watch because that is very individualized for my family and for each of my kids. What you decide is enough screen time or device usage or you know, apps and shows and things like that, that you're okay with for your family, that's individualized to your family. And that is, you know, your decision. You know how responsible your kids are or accountable or how will they follow your rules and guidance. And I know what mine will do. And so I don't want to tell you like, hey, this is how we do it and have you think, well, you know, hey, we aren't doing it that way. Maybe we're doing something wrong. You need to individualize it to your kids and, and your family's thoughts on things. So I, I won't give specifics on that. What I will say, though, is that I am not, I am not that super, super strict person who, you know, says no screen time ever unless it's, unless it's for school. That's just, you know, how I am. Do I give them unlimited reign? No. But do I completely ban it? No. I also have always wanted to, you know, look at things as, are they a way that I can prepare them for the future? And, and maybe I'm not explaining that super great, but I'll try here. When they hit 18 and they leave the home and they're paying for their own cell phones and they can decide, you know, what it is they want to do. Do I want them to suddenly feel the need to gorge all of the stuff that is available online all at once. I mean, do I want them to go, oh, finally, I can see what TikTok's all about and then gorge a bunch of crap on TikTok or get sucked into the rabbit hole that can be, you know, Instagram or other social media programs and things like that? No. Um, do I want them to be fooled by marketing and advertising techniques and algorithms that try to divert their attention towards certain things? No. I want my kids to leave my home being smart consumers of technology, whether that's the things that they choose to view and the content they cho choose to consume and things that they choose to buy or purchase or use or do. I want them to be smart consumers about that. And so rather than putting a blanket ban on everything, instead I try to use different apps and devices and things like that as teaching tools. When it comes to something like Instagram, for example, you know, they see me put together Instagram posts. So they know the amount of time and work and, you know, adjusting of lighting and backgrounds and camera angles and things like that it takes to make a post. You know, it's not simply a point and click and it's not always, you know, as perfect as you try to make it seem uh, for a post. And so they see that and we talk about that and we talk about when we see something on Instagram, you know, what did that content creator have to do to get that to look that way or to, you know, make it appear that way. They understand about algorithms. Uh, they understand that when I put a search term in somewhere, why is it that all of a sudden I'm getting inundated with emails and product images and advertisements for things related to that across multiple parts of social media? 
So that does not mean free reign to go through and utilize those things with no restrictions, but it does mean that I use them as teaching tools. So when they leave my house, you know, social media and um, online apps and things like that are not something that's just been like this forbidden fruit that's up on a high shelf that they've never seen before. And now they just want to dive right into it. Instead, it's something that they've been gradually taught about and taught how those things work. You know, how do those things market to kids your age? How is it that they start to, you know, try to get you to go a certain way or view certain things or purchase certain things or try certain things? So again, they can be smart consumers, not just of products and merchandise, but also of media as they get older. And that's a little bit about how my high schoolers utilize technology in our homeschool. Do be sure to check out the other great videos in this month's playlist. I will have that link down below in the description box for you. I'll also have links to any products or programs that we utilize in our homeschool down below for you in the description box. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give me a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button and that notification bell so you can be notified when I post new content. Thanks so much for joining me today, everybody. Happy homeschooling. Mm -hmm.